Okay, so the presentation will be pretty much uh, interactive. We start immediately with an interactive uh, section, which is definition of minimalism. Anybody wants to give it a try? What is minimalism? What do you think minimalism is about? Colin? The shortest distance between two points. <laughs> <laughs> wow. wow, that's a very nice one. Fred? I have one. Minimalism is the baroque of the lazy people. Oh, wow, great! <laughs> That's a very nice one. That's a very nice one. Please go on. Minimalism is going up on the idea that um, perfection is reached when there's um, nothing to take away. Okay, that's very good as well. Okay, anybody else? Please. Very equal Good if it's food for us, and that if someone only wants to make it equal in these ways. Okay, that's good. What? I, 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 go on, Laurent. Minimalism is. Minimalism is doing what needs to be done and not uh, and not a thing more. Great. I think I like the most. Laurent, gone. And Fred, gone. And I will keep one to use. But even if your explanation was a bit too, you know, too much for a minimalism, but I like it. Perfection is achieved when not when there is nothing more more to add, but when there is nothing left to remove. I always like this one. I think I read this book the first time when I was 11 or something, and everybody knows it. Definitely, definitely a, uh, definitely something, and uh, and I really like it. Okay, so I could stop my presentation here. <laughs> Please. Okay, someone uh, from the from the street is saying that minimalism is getting rid of bullshit. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tell them, tell them to send me an email. I will send them a chocolate. <laughs> Okay, so my presentation could stop here uh, because we're talking about minimalism. But unfortunately, we are we are all on on our way towards achieving minimalism. So minimalism is not something that you that you get in step for all. It's a buff. It's not you know, it's not an object. It's more an objective, right? That, rather than a concept that is always with you. So where uh, uh, where is minimalism being uh, being um, theorized? Let's say. There are a lot of different uh, uh, minimalist um, movements around. It's not just something that comes at all from, from software or from engineering at all. Uh, it, it, I think the best examples kind of come from literature, and I guess uh, Japanese uh, haikus are one of the best examples of minimalism, and we'll see a couple of them, not just Japanese ones. Uh, then architecture, actually, uh, is one field where minimalism has been uh, put to the extreme. There is the, the most uh, iconic uh, formalization of minimalism is this deal, which, which is Dutch, the Dutch movement from the 1920. And, uh, and they, they, they said, okay, look, architecture should try to, uh, uh, try to simplify everything. But we, we'll see a couple of examples uh, later on. Then music, we have several, uh, especially Northern European musicians and Japanese musicians. Uh, which have, uh, who have actually uh, provided a very, very nice uh, contribution to minimalism. And then we have cinema, cinema, other arts, and obviously also computing, even if recently it's becoming more and more difficult to have minimal stuff. So let's start with uh, literature, okay? <clears throat> uh, minimalism in literature. Uh, this is one of the first, uh, what well, most known haikus around. Haikus are very short. Uh, very short points. Short to the point that normally they have 17, 16 or 17 uh, syllables. So that, that's it. And, uh, and this runs like that. Uh, an ancient poem, a frog jumps in a splash of water. And in 17 short syllables, sounds actually, it's already evoking a, a, a whole uh, bunch of different uh, emotions. Okay, this is the this is the uh, the, the um, uh, goal of this kind of composition. But I'm not an expert in uh, in Japanese haikus at all. This is from the one of the masters, the, the masters of haikus. I will give you more mundane examples of haikus from a very good friend, uh, who's Gabriel Tavelio from uh, Freaknet, who uh, actually uh, challenged himself into haikus of different sort. And let's start with the first one. This is one that was composed last year. Uh, and said, forget it, he said, and shot himself. 
wow. I mean, it's uh, how how much the research behind it. I mean, what what could have what kind of emotions uh, it, it it brings to you? Okay, but you might be more geeky people. And then I have another one for you. This fold. Fresh backup is on the shelf. The sun is shining. <laughs> It's absolutely awesome. There is another one which is even better. And it's security through obscurity. I turn the light on. What a shame. <laughs> I mean, you see, it's, it's still hypers. Uh, we are still laughing about it. It's still literature. And, uh, and it's uh, absolutely minimal. It's, it's, it's bringing to us a whole bunch of emotions of all sorts of kinds. And then yeah, I close with this, with this one. This is a, a very nice one. Uh, this was composed on the, on the night before general elections in Italy. And uh, it goes like, even in Palazzolo, I wish you could turn around. No atomic mushrooms. I mean, this is so extremely powerful in Italian. I tried this, this, uh, this translation. I hope as best I wouldn't mind it. Uh, but in Italian, it's so, so beautiful, okay? So this is the kind of stuff we are talking about. Architecture. So we, we said that minimalism is also about architecture. And uh, <laughs> this is an example. This is, one of, this is the only house that is considered fully minimalist. So this is a uh, sublimation of the concept of minimalism in architecture. This is the, the house. It could be a house from any historical period uh, in, in, in the human development, okay? So it's the house. I don't exactly know where it is. I think it's in the Netherlands, but I'm not sure about that. Again, I'm not an architect. But this is the kind of things we are talking about. And uh, another example is this one, which is another house uh, in Sweden, I guess, from the 1950s. And you see, I mean, this is also immortal. It's minimalist and immortal. It has the same kind of structure of the houses of water from the Paleolithic, <laughs> and still the same functionality of the best of the northern European design inside. So this is the kind of stuff we are, we are talking about. And minimalism is also something that has been explored in uh, music. And uh, this is a Composition from a composer called uh, Christensen um, from the 60s and 70s. We'll stop soon, no worries. But it, it contains very few basic sounds, and then it continues, goes on and on. And then we go to something that we should know much better. Um, the World Wide Web, okay? Uh, which is, you know, minimalist by design. If you look back to the first web page ever published, it's saying, come on, the web is gonna rock the world, because it's so beautiful, so minimal, so, so broken today. And uh, I won't go any, any longer into the reason why the web is broken, but uh, there have been, been some attempts into getting the web back to, uh, to the original design. Okay, at least three different um, proposals. And I, I will, I will, I will uh, um, show you them. The first one is this one, and says this is a motherfucking website and goes on and on in saying why this is the kind of style that websites should have. Minimal, very essential, straight to the point, just using uh, uh, very few tags and pointed lists and stuff like that. Okay, this is the first example. Number one. The second one, why are you laughing at me? Sorry? Reading. Oh yeah, yeah, you have the links afterwards. The second one is this one. 
I have to say, this is the motherfucking website. <laughs> and uh, uh, this, this looks much more like the, website of, the websites of today, if you think about it, in terms of style. But, uh, come on, don't laugh at me. I, I mean, I, I feel bad. Uh, but, you know, it's still pretty much, uh, pretty much um, straight to the point. Okay, so this is our example number two. And then we have our example number three. Which is something that all those define, oh, this is the best motherfucking website. <coughs> okay? And it has lots of stuff, it has some color, it has links of different colors, it has style sheets, it has also Java uh, JavaScript, uh, it has all sorts of, uh, all sorts of icons, uh, CSS3, HTML5, uh, it, can, it supports HTTP2, whatever. Else. Hey. Images yeah. of cats, yeah. the internet is yeah. for cats, for kittens, you know. Uh, yeah, it is satire. They, they say, okay, the previous examples are just uh, lame. Great. I said, okay, which is the most minimalist website according to your, to your uh, taste? Motor well, X coming. The first one. The first one. Yeah, because there's nothing left to take away. Yeah. There's no CSS, there's no Java. It's already been. Go. Yeah. Anybody else? The second <laughs> leaves more like space. Two. The second leaves more space, so it's good or bad? I like it. You like it, okay. Anybody else? Okay. I am a scientific person. I like feeling, I, 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 I love actually feelings, but when it comes to this stuff, I would like to have hard uh, science helping me to assess which is the best. <coughs> So I said something very simple. I, uh, I compared the content versus total size. Well, the content for me is defined as the whatever remains when you have, when you have stripped all the tags. Okay? So our original motherfucking website uh, has 3K of text and uh, 5K of uh, 5 kilobytes of HTML. The ratio is 0 0.68. Okay? 68% of the stuff is actual content. The rest is formatting. The second one has a ratio of 0 0.75. The third one, if we don't take into account CSS, has a ratio of 0 0.47. If we take into account CSS, it has a ratio of 0 0.36. If we take into account JavaScript, it goes down to 0 0.27. So I didn't bother to put it here, okay? You should be uh, always moderate in Critics. Great, this is just a measure. Come on, the, what, what does it mean? It's nothing. Okay, let's try another one. I tried with the more scientific one, which is the good model of complexity, uh, which is basically how much, uh, how much is the entropy of, uh, of the text with respect to whatever it could be. I won't go into the details. Higher is better. The original one is 0 0.71, the second one is 0 0.74, the third one is 0 0.48. Okay, and then I did something that. Uh, that comes from the Unix tradition. I used a nice uh, tool that is called Style. All of you know that, right? No, don't lie, nobody uses it. And you should, because it's a very nice tool. Uh, it tells you, it computes a lot of metrics about texts. These appeared in uh, Unix Documental work Workbench 1.0, 1978, okay? Before version 7, Unix version 7. So, 100, in this case, I, I just said one of the this. 100 is easy, 0 is hard, in terms of readability. Great! The best motherfucking website is at 52. The second one is at 71. The third one is at 77. Okay? So in terms of how hard it is to just read the text, the third one is even harder. So they claim to be the best motherfucking website, forgetting size, forgetting everything. In order to make their point, they had to use a much harder to read text. What kind of minimalism is that if we have to explain it? Come on! <laughs> what are we talking about? So just to, just to recap, to summarize, the first one is best in readability. Because it, it has the highest index in terms of readability. The second one is best in content versus bullshit ratio. Because it just goes straight to the point. It doesn't, doesn't use too much. 
The third one, well, they have totally, possibly totally missed the point at all. Despite they say they are the best minimalist whatever uh, stuff around. So the quest for minimalism from the web co uh, uh, point of view is not just about size. It's not about size. It's not just about readability. It's not just about cuteness. It's not just about how many times you've stripped off. It's exactly about how efficiently information is presented to and accessed by the readers. Presented to and accessed by. So it's not just a matter of presentation, how does it look like, but how, how easy it is for the people who actually read it to understand what you wanted to tell them. These are two different things. Completely different things. Okay, this is the lesson we can say we have learned today from the web. Let's go to something that we like, we like much more software, okay? Ah, there is so much minimalist software around, right? For instance, in Unix, keep it simple, stupid, philosophy at work, everything, everything is uh, conceived, was conceived like that in the Unix world. Simple tools, set, cut, rep, tr, cut, paste, oak. I bet that at least 40% of you didn't know that we had cut and paste in Unix. I'm kidding, I know you don't. Small orthogonal API, at least initially, we had 29 system calls. We, in Linux today, we are beyond 320. So, small code base is much less true with modern Unix system, systems. And, the most important aspect of all, constrained environment. Constrained environment doesn't mean that you are not able to do stuff because of just technological constraints. You might, be able, you might not be able to do more stuff or to add more blood just because you don't want to. You have decided that your design must remain simple. This is what we did, they did when, the, when Unix was ported to the VAX architecture which was much more powerful than PDP-11, yet ran basically exactly the same code. Although there was much more room for bloating it up. They didn't, because they had decided that the constrained environment was key. Okay? Unfortunately, this is not always the case. This is how the Linux kernel size has increased over time, but this is just a bare mesh. Forget, forget the real number, it's just cut all, 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 all around, just to give you an idea. We started with Linux 2.0 uh, in um, 1996, up around uh, 8, kilobyte, uh, 8 megabytes, it's the old source code in target zip. And we are at around uh, 94 megabytes with Linux 4.0 which has risen a bit more to 110 megabytes with Linux 5.0, okay? So, is the Linux kernel a mini an example of minimalism or not? That's a question for you, and there is more chocolate eggs to come. Hmm? No, and it never aimed to be, from what I understand, mm -hmm. because they want to support variation of hardware, people, needs, blah, 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 blah. Okay, anybody else? It could still be cast as minimalist, um, except that they're growing the, the support for various different architectures, memory, CPUs, GPUs, okay. um, and that's going to cause it to just rise continuously until they start culling the really old stuff, which I think they do, but maybe not as, as, as often as... You know what is uh, the largest directory in the... Linux source tree. If you ever have a, a, a tar unzipped the Linux source tree, I'll tell you. It's the directory called drivers. Today it, it contains 85% of the code in the Linux kernel. But that's unfair because most of the drivers are in other parts of the kernel. Under FS, for instance, all the file systems. Under net, all the different network protocols. If we just strip this stuff, the kernel itself has remained an astonishing less than 5% of the old mess. So the kernel itself, it's still a very small piece of code. 
Any of you can go through it and understand what is going on. Any of you can go through it. But what has grown around it is a wealth of other stuff which is needed to support new needs, new users, and also it also needed to, it was also needed to support other as old as 35 years ago. You still can, in principle, run the Linux kernel on a i386 with an ISA or an MCA bus from 1993. There is no other operating system nowadays that can do, that can do the same, except for NetBSD. None of them. Because the le legacy is important. So, minimalism is not just about size. It's also about creating minimal disruptions in your user base. So, I'm not sure whether Linux is or not minimalist, but for sure there has been some drive to keep it small, as small as possible, while at the same time maintaining as, a, a large, user, as, a, 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 as large a user base as possible. Hmm. So, we will we'll stay here with a, with a question mark, maybe. But there are some good efforts to re-establish minimalism, at least in the Unix, uh, in the Unix um, field. Um, one of the most well-known examples is Suckless, which is a community of coders um, uh, that has started at the end, at the end of the 19, 1990s to rebuild the, the old uh, user space with simple tools. Uh, there is another community uh, which is much newer but has roots in supplements in many ways uh, with Bitrage. Parazin is, uh, is uh, one of the most uh, prolific members of this community. Oh, by now, I think all of you have a Gopher client installed. <laughs> <laughs> we made sure of that, right? <laughs> That's right. And they are concentrating on minimal software, minimal protocols, Gopher, security, security through minimalism. So trying to go right to the point and uh, to avoid overbloating your stuff. Just because that's not the right thing. That's not the right thing. Another good example of minimalism, or quest for minimalism, is uh, uh, Muzo, which is a re-implementation of the uh, libc, which is the interface of the kernel, uh, done in a more <laughs> sensible way, um, re restructured from scratch, uh, reorganized in such a way that everything works uh, in a, with the minimum possible effort, and uh, still something that, that works pretty well in several different environments, not just Linux. Okay? And then there is another, another nice example that I like a lot. This is the tiny C compiler from, from Fabrice uh, Bellard. Uh, if you are in IOCCC, a fan of uh, the international obfuscated C called context, you will remember that this was the winning entry in 2001, I guess. And this is a compiler which started in 2 kilobytes. ANSI C compiler, which originally was a complete ANSI C compiler in 2 kilobytes. Now, okay, then he de obfuscated a bit and made the project. But still, is the smallest possible, one of the smallest possible compilers, full, fully ANSI compatible, uh, compatible compilers around. You have it in uh, Demo Minimal Life, by the way, by the fault. If I had to, to, to put GCC there, we would have need to add a maybe 30 or 40 megabytes more bloat. Okay? Oh, sorry, more stuff. But with GCC, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> and then there is another nice, nice example that is LibreSSL, which is an attempt to re rethink TLS from scratch, still from the OpenBSD uh, um, crew. Now there is another quiz. What do you think is the most powerful ASCII character? Oh, no, 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 I'm not talking about a Devon character which uses Devon ASCII. I'm talking about <laughs> the ASCII chaser. What is the thing that, if you removed it, would break apart Unix in the most possible? Yeah, please. No. No. Uh, escape. Escape. Line feed. Line feed. Backspace. Backspace. What else? Uh, 
13. Enter. Okay. Carriage return. Okay. I think I'll, I'll eat this one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make an example to get us closer. Do you know what is large scale distributed computing? If you don't know, it's just a way of uh, distributing a, 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 a large task onto different CPUs automatically. So you just uh, fire up the task and it will be executed and then you recollect the result and you are presented with the result. Okay? Great. There is a fantastic platform uh, developed by Apache, which is called Hadoop. Oh, by the way, the bullshit version that page is 0 0.41. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but I mean we're not interested in their web pages for the moment. It's a, it's a nice platform with with nice uh, routes into functional programming. It uses MapReduce and stuff like that. Anyway, so what would you use Hadoop for? Uh, one guy said, "Okay, I have 1.75 gigabytes of uh, data about all chess official chess tournament played around the world in the last century." Okay, this is what you can download, for instance, from the week in chess, TWIC, if you are into chess. Task, compute some statistics on the number of uh, ties, wins, with black, white, and whatnot. Solution one, use Hadoop with MapReduce. Several machines, actually seven CPUs, took 26 minutes. Okay? Solution two, use a pipe of three commands and do the same bloody stuff in 12 seconds. I'm not kidding. This is what this guy did. This is what he did. Common online tools can be 235 times faster than your Hadoop cluster. He ran it on his computer 12 seconds instead of firing a job on a cloud whatever in, uh, in the East Coast. Please. Uh, you have suitable problems yes. with like terabytes of data and sometimes exactly the command line is faster. Yes. So you evaluate your problem before you throw it at your yeah. cluster. That's that's the point. And that's what exactly well, I, I'll give it to you then. <laughs> <laughs> oh sorry. That's one more. <laughs> that's the point. Minimalism is not about facing the problems head down with all the cannons you can find around. Minimalism is sitting down, try to understand what the heck of a problem you have there, and try to see which tool can actually do that. If you go through this page, you will have the link in the presentation anyway. The presentation is just blue text. Okay, <laughs> I'll explain it later. And, uh, and you'll see how he it, how it did. So he started with a simple example. He said, okay, it might work. Then he went to something that, that took one minute. Then he said, okay, we can cut and cut stuff there. And he, at, at the end, the command is really a pipeline, pipeline of three commands. I think this is the final one. Uh, yes, this is the final one. Okay? Okay, looks, looks awful, but it's not that awful. I mean, if you're into oak and, and find and XRs, it's pretty straightforward. It's not, it's not rocket science at all. It's just uh, thinking about your problem and solving it with the most effective uh, tool. So the most powerful ASCII character, if you remove it, nothing will even boot, is pipe. <laughs> Absolutely, because this is, the, this is the thing which allowed Unix to become a system usable by people who couldn't actually program. It was invented in 1971 by Doug McElroy, who was the head of the uh, Unix, well, it wasn't called Unix at that time yet, the Unix group, uh, room 1174, <laughs> in AT&T Labs, Murray Hill. He came up, called it one night, and uh, said, look, process must be connected through a pipe. And they wrote 120, they say, they, I mean, uh, Ken and, uh, and Dennis Rich say, they wrote about 120 scripts on the first day, just because they could. 
take the output of a comment, pipe it to something else, and do something more. That is the single way that has boosted Unix the most. Use simple mechanisms, connect simple stuff, get something that is much more than the sum of their parts. Because that pipe is just made of silly comments. But what it does is absolutely awesome. It's much more than the three comments put one after the other. Okay. Let's get back to something that we might know better. Linux distros. Okay, now that we have another, yet another question. And uh, I, I have always been a pas passionate about a minimal Linux uh, distros. I will, I will show a couple of them. But before, before we go into that, do you remember which distro used this logo? I'm getting old. I'm, I'm just 39, but I'm a few very old. <laughs> None of you. Tom's? Very good. You get one. Tom's root boot. Ah, sorry, I was kidding. <laughs> I'm just older. <laughs> <laughs> this is Tom's root boot uh, distribution. This is a distribution that was prepared in 19... The first version, I think, is from 1997. And uh, it stayed in one floppy, including kernel and everything, a floppy, a, a hyper-formatted floppy of 1.7 megabytes. Okay? Mm. So there's a little trick there. But it had everything. You could use that floppy and get on the internet and read email, uh, read news groups, um, browse the web, browse the web, and everything in 1.7 megabytes. Okay? Then we have something like New Linux. Uh, Italians not remember it. This was uh, one of the historical distributions uh, put together by Andrea Kanji initially and then, and then developed by an entire community. 12, 12 to 12, uh, 2 to 12 floppies according to which system you wanted. So the base system is just 2 floppies, 2.8 megabytes. The rest you had all sorts of applications, a la Slackware, let's say, entire packages in, in each single floppy. And you could run a full system, a full Linux system, in 24, 28 megabytes. Okay? This is what we are talking about. Actually, less than that. And then I think the one, one that is a... Uh, uh, the distribution we are all uh, remembering with, with fondness is down small Linux, which learned us how to uh, strip down systems that were already in the region of one gigabyte at this point. Okay? The problem with minimal, minimalist distros is that one thing leads to another. So once you have minimal distros, say, okay, now why don't we add this and that? Why don't we try to put there this and that? So if we now go to the uh, list of lightweight Linux distribution on Wikipedia, 19, uh, 12, um, 8, 19, uh, 2019, so today, this is what we have. So I, I, I sorted them by size. Uh, the first one is basic Linux, which I think is, is that as well. Uh, then we have open WRT, which is still kicking a lot. <laughs> And then we have something that is around 8 megabytes Alpine Linux, 130 megabytes for the, for the disk, Tiny Core, Nano Linux, Dunsmo, which is dead, Cytax, which is dead. Uh, and then we start with a plethora of, of distributions which are up to 1.7 gigabytes. A lightweight distribution in 1.7 gigabytes. Come on! It's like saying a lightweight man of 135 kilograms. <laughs> right? I'm not that far from that, but still. I don't, I don't claim I'm slim. I don't. Um, now is the question. Is that one minimal life a minimal district? I've criticized all these districts that have blown up themselves into the megabytes and gigabytes. Devil Minimal Live in Jesse is 300 megabytes. In ASCII is around 300, 360 megabytes. Now I ask you, is Devil Minimal Live a minimal distro? If we just look at size, we should say no. Nico? I think you would argue the same way as for about uh, Linux. 
you know, for me, I mean, you argue in a nice way that it is somewhat minimal. If you look at the core of it, it's gone. But I would say also, like, from, as you say, like, from the size, if you look at the wall size, you can't say it's minimal. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't even fit the memory of my open book anymore. So, yeah. in this regard, I would say no. But on the other hand, I would also question a little bit there, like, how minimal can it be? Because you have to require, like, for the sum, you know, the price is like, I know, if you want to support people working on their Apple devices, um, you want to offer something, so maybe it is minimal for the purpose of giving. Okay, stop there, otherwise, we'll blow up my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> Chocolate, come. I also, I also have a comment. Uh -huh. I think it's, it was minimal. Before I told you to put a bunch of stuff inside there and you agreed. <laughs> it's probably my fault that it's not me. <laughs> we get back to that. I, I, I have to tell you, before we go into the details, uh, which would not be uh, deep details anyway, uh, if we remove just the localization stuff from demo minimal life, we cut about 35 megabytes from here. If we remove the man pages for all the software that we have there, we cut an additional 25 megabytes from here. If we remove the C compiler and the libc dev, we cut an additional 32 megabytes from here, which is already 100 megabytes. But we would have made a system which could be usable only, usable only by English-speaking people which know everything about every command they have, don't need, don't, don't need a man, and are not even able to compile an error word on their computer. Please. Why not replace GCC by TCC? <laughs> Why not replace GCC by TCC? It's, uh, it's impossible, I'm afraid, because our, our, uh, uh, most of our user space depends on feature that GCC has and our compi other compilers don't. Even even this is becoming less and less true with music and stuff like that. But this is not. This is a very good point, Ash. Okay, so is there a minimal, a really a minimal distro? I, I put forward a minimal test. It's not just to uh, to excuse myself, but it has a whole lot of admin and recovery tools, so it can be used as a recovery tool by itself. There is no totally useless stuff. There is exactly one application for each kind. You will not find three email clients. You will not find three browsers or news readers. You will not find three of anything. Just find one. Whatever I choose. If you have comments on some suggestion, please send them over. But you find one. This constitutes the necessary environment including games and fun for blind and visually impaired users. If they have a live system like that, they can a blind or visually impaired person can function properly from the first moment he or she gets at the console with anything they have to do, from network configuration to uh, uh, network navigation in all sort of ways, email, fun, spreadsheets, task management, editors, um, languages, and whatnot. It could be stripped down farther and remain functional. Yes, it could, but it would be functional for a smaller user base. And I think that I really uh, like what Nico said. Minimal is also about what you want your system to serve. So in a sense, this is not minimal in terms of size, but if we strip it down to 50 megabytes, and we could do that. I started from there. I started from a system that, that, that fitted in 50 megabytes. But it was totally useless. You could just use oak, grep, set. Didn't have any man, didn't have any language, didn't have support for all day, uh, for, all, uh, for frame buffer, for instance, which is used a lot by blind and visually impaired, impaired users. You can also look uh, read PDF in minimal life which is not needed for us, because we wouldn't. But for a, for a blind person, it's important to have the possibility to 
convert the PDF into a proper text file and go through it. Okay, so this is my point about it. Now I, I drive in, I, I'm almost done. Uh, how much time do I have? I don't know, but we are enjoying. <laughs> go on. Now I'll show you how easy it is you have time. to blow something. Totally. Okay? And I'll show you with a nice example. Do you know, you always know PDOF. PDOF is one of the uh, tools into uh, uh, sysbinit uh, scripts. Uh, sysbinit tools, however it's called. I don't remember that. Whatever. One of the three binary packages of sysbinit. And it's just used to find the uh, PIDs of processes by name. Okay, this is something that you can do with the script. But PDOF does that, that, that. And it returns this is my actually PDOF of XTERM at that time. It returns the, all the uh, PIDs of all the process whose common name is what you put as first argument, separated by space. Okay? If you haven't tried it, try it, but you know, it's better than me. Okay. There was a Debian bug back in 2010 from a user who said, we need arbitrary output format for PDOF. And I'll show you the I'll show you the bug report. Uh, this is the one. Arbitrary output format for PDOF. Basically, the user says, I use a lot PDOF with S trace. I would like to say S trace minus P for all <laughs> stuff in PDOF. Please include a flag that is uh, proposed to call um, F, which takes a format. From, from the user and, uh, and, uh, and then use that, uses that format in printf to, to print the stuff. Okay? This bug stayed there for nine years. Now, you know that two years ago, uh, Jess Smith from DistroWatch, which is a person we are extremely indebted with, stepped up, stepped up and said, I will maintain this build. Okay? And he's doing an enormous job in doing that. He's gone, he's gone through all day more than 300 bugs together with other people. Uh, Dimitri Big of, uh, Bogotov is another of them. Uh, uh, through all the 400 bugs in Sysbinity in Debian, trying to close all of those that were obsolete, trying to solve all of those that could be solved, trying to understand what's going on there. And now the number of bugs is down to 150 in six months. Okay, it's done. They have done an enormous, enormous job. So he said, I will incorporate this fix in sysbinit 2.93. Okay? Great. The problem is that a friend of us, uh, uh, Matteo from Technorado from uh, Red Up, uh, oh, he's a friend of us uh, anyway. Okay, <laughs> forget this bullshit. <laughs> forget it. Uh, so he said, look, if you do that, if you just accept unsanitized input from the user, you're going to be fucked up. And this is an example. So he showed that it's possible to read the stack, the stack of the calling process and retrieve sensible information because the patch was in post. So Jesse was in good faith, but the patch was actually a security risk. Okay. So, uh, so you say, wouldn't you need to have some process which uh, was passing untrusted data directly to the F argument? And then, uh, and then, uh, and then Jess said, quite naively, because you think, okay, we're solving a problem. The problem is that. You accept all kinds of unsanitized input from the user, then restrict it. Just allow the input to be a character, a single character. Okay? Great. So he said, look, just neuter them, that, and allow the, 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 the parameter of uh, f to be a single character. What the fuck are we doing here? PID. PID of is already separating bits with the character. It's already doing that. There is no need to pass another flag 
in order to tell him which character it should separate, use to separate. If it's just one character. You can do that with TR. Whatever, there are so many ways of doing that. So, I, at a certain point, I stepped in very humbly and said, please, stop the madness. If we are using a flag just to let a process do whatever it's already doing, just in a slightly different way, then it's the best way of introducing blocks. Forget it. PDOF is already printing the PIDs as integers. And any formatting can, but I would say must, be done downstream by set of TR, whatever you like. Because this is what the Unix way is about. <coughs> Do not bulk functions into a, each and every uh, tool. Make a tool that has this function, reuse it. Use the pipe as much as you can. Minimalism in Devon. Is Devon a minimal distribution in any way? I think I will surprise you by saying that the most minimal element of Devon is Unprov. It is, and I will show you that, that this is the case. Unprovla is the most minimal element of Devon. What does it do? Now, let's start with what Unprovla does not do. Unprovla is not serving any package at all. Amprola is not hosting a Devon repository at all. Amprola is not redirecting you to a Debian repository at all. Please, record it. <laughs> Send it to the mailing list. I'm so silly fuck. Tired of repeating the same stuff. Well, Amprola is blocking and don't get re 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 redirected. No, it's not Amprola. Amprola is working fine. Okay? So it's not doing any of these things. So what is he do what is he doing? And probably it's an asynchronous tool which pulls down Devon and the corresponding Debian suites, uh, parts of repositories. It creates a merged repo for each suite where the Devon specific packages override the, the ones coming from Debian, because this is what we want. And then it signs the repository and in repository files of each suite. If you have any doubt about uh, that one having a problem with signing keys, you have just to check these two files. Okay, that's enough. This is GPG 8192 bits key, which is signing our repositories. And this is a machine that is offline, not reachable except from, uh, by three people, and absolutely <laughs> very hard to get into. Okay, then we can discuss about HTTPS or whatever you like. But this is what is making your dumb repository fine and absolutely secure. Okay, and then at the end it pushes the repo to package master and packages. Hmm? Okay, this is the old picture. We wanted a nice picture. Sorry for that. I'm not able to do a nice picture in a small amount of time. But this is the old the old picture. Uh, so, Devoness, which at this point will become developers, uh, contribute to a package pushing into git devonov, which is our GitLab server. Then somebody, who is authorized to do that, files up a build in our continuous integration infrastructure, which is served at the moment by Jenkins. Okay? Jenkins has a pool of build hosts, which are uh, for different architectures. Each build host is given the uh, sources, build them up, uh, sign them, and get them back to the CI, uh, CI server. The CI server finally push this stuff into DAC. For those of you who don't know what DAC is, is a repository management tool which has a database on the back end to, uh, 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 to maintain all the metadata about the repository itself. Then, uh, DAC pushes 
the Devon part of the repository, just the Devon part of the repository, to Package Master. Okay? At this point, every two minutes, an umbrella job is run. Oh, sorry, parenthesis. It is run every two minutes because umbrella was rewritten again uh, one and a half year ago, maybe two years ago, uh, by Parasit. And uh, rewriting a piece of code that was written by Franco Lanza was very nice, but it was enormously slow for the task. So we had to wait 24 hours for a package to enter the repository. Now Umbrella can run in uh, under five minutes. So every two minutes, this job uh, goes to the Debian part of the repo, pulls down the corresponding Debian part of the repo, does the match. There is no magic here. I put just magic, but it's not magic. Does the match. It's totally magic. I'm Sorry? Sure it's totally magic. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Just look at the, at the code. And then it pushes the merged version of the repo, what we put in your, in your sources.list file back in package master. And then all the mirrors uh, are synced from package master. Okay? This is what we are relying upon. Is this minimal? Is this, is this minimal? Yes. Because tomorrow we can pick any of these components, kick it up, and replace with something else. We can put aptly instead of duck, already working on that. We can stop using Debian how we want. But in principle, we could merge another repository here. We could Remove Jenkins and use another technology for building hosts. We could remove GitLab, but still, what, what is... Oh, we should actually. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, what is important here is the interface. Git here, hmm? simple uh, HTTP requests here, okay? And then rsync here, rsync here, rsync here, rsync here. Are seen here. That's it. We rely basically on thin air. And it's great. <laughs> if you think about it, if you have to fork a new distribution from an existing one, you should, in principle, have an installable base which you manage, which means you have to build it up, provide the packages, and uh, put them in your own repo. If we had to do that in 2014-2015, we wouldn't be here today. I'm sorry. If we had to build yeah. even 1,000 of the basic Debian, Debian packages, there wouldn't exist any dev one at all. Mm. Next time, and the people who worked at the first Emprola were absolutely genius. In the best Unix tradition, reuse whatever you have. Minimal effort, minimal intervention, reuse whatever we can use. The dead, most of the Debian repo is fine for us. Let's just tweak it up in such a way that we can reuse it with our own, for our own needs. That's awesome. Minimal intervention. Apt only sees standard HTTP redirects. You have no, you have no difference between a Debian repo and a Debian one. No difference at all, but doesn't in really realize because also the CDN is making the CDN in Debian is making redirects mm. as well. So it's, it's fine. Support it. That's fine. There's no difference here <laughs> at all. It's a small code base. It's eleven hundred lines, including comments. Any of you could go through that and understand what is going on. Every devil should thank every day Ancrola and Debian. If it, were, if it was not for these two components, we won't be here. We wouldn't have a desktop on the one, most probably we wouldn't have a lot of stuff around. We would be stuck with a minimal system which could contain something like 70, 100, 150 packages out of more than 35,000 source packages. So please, cut it off. Cut it off and thank these two components every single day. 
when you use your Devon system. Last bit, I'm done. Another example of minimalism. Packaging, what is this? It's a web page which provides packages, it provides information about Devon packages that were three previous attempts uh, across the last four years. The first one is, was on Rails, the second one was in Python, the third one was in PHP. Very, very well engineered systems. They had problems, high query latency, because they had the framework behind. No <coughs> SQL or no SQL backend, whatever. Slow updates, because you have to update the whole database. Complex data structure, because they started for, to, for, to incorporate what, whatever was already in the packages Debian org. We can't do that. That has been built in 25 years by hundreds of humans. It's million hours. You can't do that. It's impossible. You should do that by step, step by step. Relatively large code base and requires no minimal frameworks to be installed on the actual machine. So Rails or PHP or Zend or whatever or Django or whatever. What is serving your packaging for Devon at the moment is a, a tool that uses file system as a database. Fundamental concept in Unix. The files, the files in the file system have exactly the same structure they have in the pool. <laughs> exactly. The same structure, they don't have to change anything. Static indexes, simple text files, while you're parsing something, you just create the index and you're done. And the searches are done by a chain of grep. When you put your search emacs uh, uh, space nox, mm -hmm. you are doing a, a call to a grep emacs in the, this index pipe grep nox. That's it. And uh, it's done in CGI. In total, it's 130 plus 120 lines of Golan code <coughs> plus, in total, 80 lines of template. If it's not minimal, what the hell is it? It's not perfect, but it's something that already works. Okay. <laughs> These are instructions if you ever think about migrating your own website on Gopher on every first. Minimum, again, make a backup of your site's available folder, put whatever you want in your, in your new HTML file, add this rewrite to all your server stances in NGNIX, convert HTML to Gopher Maps uh, or text with set or oak. This was done in most part by parasite, especially for the static pages. Clone your media and uh, restart NGINX. That's just restart NGINX. Hmm? Put it back at uh, 1, 4 p.m. on the every first. <laughs> That's it. Is this minimal? Yes. It's minimal risk, minimal effort. <laughs> Minimal disruption, minimal everything. Sorry if it hurt somebody, but still, it's in the same dumb spirit. And done with safety and security in mind. Every single second. You never risk anything. You are not fooled. You make jokes. Conclusion Minimalist is a lifestyle, according to me. You must strive to have small components, small code base. No complications, but beware, this requires hard work. It's much easier to reuse and rebloat stuff that has already bloated. This requires hard work. But it's worth it because you get to something that is much more beautiful. Sorry for being long and thank you.